Good evening, my friends, and welcome to week six of the Apprentice series, Jesus Christ, our rock. Uh, this week, we're going to look at uh, how Moses brought water from a rock from the Israelites a second time, and what is the significance for us um, in the New Testament, the New Covenant. Um, I'd love to pray for us, and uh, let's get into it. Lord, as we just come before you this evening, and we continue to look at uh, Jesus as our rock, and the foundations of our faith. I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit, that you would come and just guide us and lead us into all truth in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Do you remember the song that we, we looked at last week? Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flow be for me since double cure to save me from its guilt and its power. You remember that we spoke about Jesus' blood and how that Jesus' blood washes away the guilt and the same that sin has produced in my life. You remember that I had this illustration of uh, this glass of water and how we said that man, though mankind had been made sinlessly perfect by God in the Garden of Eden, that what happened is sin entered the world and that um, man's spirit, soul and body that were made sinlessly perfect by God in the Garden of Eden became corrupted. Man's spirit died to the things of God and became alive to the things of Satan. And that man's soul, his mind, will and emotions had become corrupted and tainted by sin and its power. And that his body had also been influenced. And so man was a fallen, sinful human being. And therefore the need for the forgiveness of our sins. And so Jesus' blood, remember what we looked at last week, Jesus' blood comes and he washes us and he cleanses us and he forgives us of our sins and that we are clothed with his righteousness and that our spirits are born again and regenerated by Jesus Christ. Remember we looked at that last week, all right? And we also spoke about the tenses of salvation. The Bible says that we have been saved, we are being saved, and one day we will be saved and that uh, that relates to our body, soul and spirit that our, our, our spirits are instantaneously justified, born again, that, that, that our spirits are, are, are regenerated because of Jesus' blood and because of the forgiveness of our sins. But our minds, our minds, our will, our emotions, our souls, that needs sanctification, that needs a cleansing, that needs a process by where we can uh, change our hearts, change our minds, and change our wills and our emotions. And that's what we're going to look at this week. Um, and that's what we're going to look at there in that song, Sins Double Cure. You see, on the one hand, we need forgiveness of our sins. But on the other hand, we also want to be set free from sin's power and influence and control in our lives, in our minds, in our wills, and our emotions. And that's what we're going to look at this week. So let me, yeah. So we're going to read from Numbers chapter 20. And we're going to read from verses 2 to verse 13. This is what it says. And it's uh, Moses bringing water from the rock a second time for the Israelites. Now there was no water for the community. And the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and Aaron and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this desert that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? There is, it has no grain, nor figs, or grapevines, or pomegranates, and there's no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting and, and, and fell prostrate, face ground before the Lord, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Verse 7, the Lord said to Moses, take your staff. And you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock that is before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community, so they and their livestock can drink. I mean, it's quite a miracle, hey? Just speak to the rock and it's going to give you water. Verse 9. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he had been commanded. And he and other Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff, and water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. 
But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you do not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I'm giving them. These are the waters of Meribah where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he showed him himself holy among them. It's very interesting this, you know, and um, you would think, sure, it was quite harsh um, of the Lord to, to tell Aaron and Moses because they didn't obey him and they didn't speak to the rock, but they struck it that they couldn't go into the promised land. But, but if you remember from last week, I was, I've been teaching us this principle that everything God instructed the people in the Old Testament to do was a shadow and a type of, and, a, and was going to be fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. And this includes this particular story. And when Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it, he was messing with God's shadow and type and the fulfillment in Jesus. And so there was this very clear instruction from the Lord to Moses, take your staff and speak to the rock. The first time in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6, Moses was to strike the rock. The second time Moses was to speak to the rock in Numbers chapter 20 and verse 8 and water would come out of it. Now why? Well, as we were saying in the beginning of this video, the first time it represented Jesus Christ, our rock, being struck by God the Father on the cross and that God the Father um, yeah, struck Jesus, causing blood and water to flow from him and that Jesus' blood covers us and forgives us of our sins and we are clothed with his righteousness and our spirits are regenerated and born again. And we looked at that in great great detail the last two weeks. Okay, that's what it means. That's why the struck rock was to be struck the, sick, the first time. But the second time, God said to them very clearly, Hey, I don't want you to strike the rock. I want you to speak to the rock. This is important because this second time of bringing water from the rock, as I said earlier, it's a shadow and a type of Jesus and him baptizing us, the church, with the Holy Spirit in the new covenant. You see, the primary work of the Holy Spirit in the life of a Christian is to help them with the process of sanctification. Remember, justification was Jesus justifying your spirit and causing your spirit to be born again and regenerated. You have been saved. You are busy being saved. That refers to the process of sanctification where your soul, your mind, will and emotions will be will will be saved and is busy being saved. And that I want to is represented by the following. And I want to just show you this illustration if you'll bear with me. Remember I had this jug of water last week and this jug of water represents the Holy Spirit, represents the Word of God and represents the Church of God. And that God wants you to be sanctified. And how he sanctifies you is through baptizing with the, you with the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit guiding you and leading you to all truth that is found in the Word of God. And discipling you in the process of the church through teachings and through relational connections with other people. And so this is literally what happens. God pours his Spirit into our souls and into our spirits. And then the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the Church of God pour truth into our minds into our wills and into our emotions and we start to live according to the truth and as our minds are renewed Jesus said you will know the truth and the truth will set you free and so our, our souls become sanctified they become cleansed they become washed by the word of God by the spirit of God and by the church of God and that's the process of sanctification two beautiful scriptures that I want to read to you from um, from the New Testament in this regard. The first one is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. This is what it says. We ought to always give thanks for you brothers, loved by God, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. So you were chosen by God to be just to be to be justified and you were chosen by God also to be sanctified through the sanctifying work of the Spirit. And through a belief in the truth, through a belief in the Bible and in the Word of God. In 1 Peter chapter 1 and verses 1 and 2, Peter the Apostle writes about this as well. Verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. We have to be always, but, but, sorry, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect, strangers in the world, 
scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ and the sprinkling of His blood. You see, we have been sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, and our spirits have been reborn, and our sins have been washed away. We have been set free. We have been forgiven of our sins by Jesus Christ. But now God wants to deal with sin's power in our life. Let the water and the blood from our ruined side which flow be for me sin's double clear to save me from its guilt, this guilt of sin, and then also the power of sin. And so the Holy Spirit is given to the believer in the new covenant to be the power, the, the empowering grace of God to sanctify us and to guide us and to lead us into all truth. John the Baptist and Jesus both taught about Jesus being the one who would baptize in the Holy Spirit and give us the living water of the Spirit. And I want to read a couple of scriptures about this. First of all, John the Baptist in John chapter 1 verses 32 to 34 says this about Jesus. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and rest on him or remain on him. Verse 33. I would not have known him, except that the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain, he is who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. You see, this is John the Baptist testing about Jesus. And when John the Baptist, Baptist baptized Jesus, we know that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and rested and remained on Jesus in the in bodily form of a dove. And, and so, Jesus, so John the Baptist knew, ah, this is the Son of God. This is the Messiah. This is the one who is going to baptize the believers with the Holy Spirit. John, uh, sorry, Jesus teaches us about this in John chapter 4 and verses 10 to 14. When he was speaking to the woman at the well, uh, he says this to her. In verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who, it, who is who asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock and his herds? Jesus answered, Anyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now see, now Jesus says, if you knew the gift of God, and the Bible is, in the Bible, the Holy Spirit is referred to as the gift of the Father or the promise of the Father. And Jesus is the one who, who baptizes us in the Holy Spirit and gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit and he refers to it here as living water, welling, as a spring of living water that will well up to eternal life inside of us. Later on in the book of John, Jesus, it's, uh, uh, speaking at the feast, says this in John chapter 7 and verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. For whoever believes in me, as a scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Verse 39. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time, the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. It's amazing. Once Jesus ascended into heaven and was glorified, the Bible says that he received the promise of the Father and then he poured out the Holy Spirit upon those who do believe. But we'll get to that in a moment. So, a couple of things from these two scriptures. We see that um, God, the Holy Spirit, is the promise of the Father and that He is also the gift of the Father. The Holy Spirit is the gift of the Father. In Luke chapter 24 and verses 49, Jesus says this, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. So Jesus was telling his disciples, listen boys, I'm going to leave you, but I want you to go into Jerusalem and I want you to wait 
because I'm going to give you the gift that my Father has promised, which is the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1 and verses 4 and 5, Jesus again was speaking to his disciples before his ascension to heaven. Listen to what he said to them. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so we can see here that Jesus taught and spoke about the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, and that how he was going to baptize the disciples with the Holy Spirit. Now this is actually fulfilled by Jesus in the lives of the disciples in Acts chapter 2, in verses 1 to 4. And I want to read the account to us. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly the sound, like a blowing of a violent wind, came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separate and come and rest on each one of them. And they were all, listen, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So how did the disciples get filled with the Holy Spirit? How did they receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And, and how do we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And quite simply, we ask the Father to give us the Holy Spirit because of Jesus' work on our behalf. You see, when God said to Moses, Hey, when you bring water out of the rock the second time, I don't want you to strike it. I want you to speak to the rock. And as you speak to the rock, I'm going to cause water to flow from it. And that's this. That's See, the first time God gives us the Holy Spirit is for when, when, when he struck Jesus on the cross and our spirits are born again and are regenerated by Jesus' finished work on the cross. Okay? And that's when we, are, we receive the Holy Spirit for salvation. But there's a second receiving of the Holy Spirit, not for salvation, but for an infilling and an empowering to be sanctified, to be regenerated, to be made holy, to be for our souls, to be renewed. Okay. And that, my friend, we don't, Jesus, Jesus isn't struck by God a second time to pour out the Holy Spirit on us. No, no, no. We simply speak to the rock. We ask Jesus to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and to give us the promise and the gift of the heart of the Father. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus, speaking about the Holy Spirit in Luke chapter 11 and verse 13, says this. If you are evil, know how to give your children good gifts. How much more will your heavenly Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? What a promise. Jesus is saying, listen. We, we, you human beings, you, you, although you're evil, when your children ask you for a good gift, you give it to them. Now, how much more, your perfectly heavenly Father, if you ask Him for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for the infilling of the Spirit, how much more will He not give Him to you? It's beautiful, hey? Remember what Jesus said? If you are thirsty, speak to the rock and ask Him to give you this living water which flows out of Him which is the person of the Holy Spirit, God's living water that flows to us. Remember Jesus promised at the feast, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture said, from within him streams of living water will flow from within him. And this, by this, he was speaking about the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the Father's gift and promise to us that is poured out into our spirits by Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit is given to us to empower us and to sanctify us and to commission us to live the life and to do the ministry that Jesus has planned and prepared for us in advance to do on this earth. Now, I want to give you nine things that the Bible and Jesus teach about what the Holy Spirit is going to do for us. Number one, He will empower you to be a witness for Jesus. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 it says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the ends of the earth. Okay, so you're going to be powered to be a witness for Jesus. 
Secondly, the, Jesus said this, that he, the Holy Spirit, will teach you all things and will remind you of Jesus' word to you from the Bible. The scripture references John chapter 14 and verse 26. But when the Holy Spirit, but, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Literally, the Holy Spirit will remind you, remind you of the scriptures of the Bible and of what Jesus has taught us. Number three, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will be given to counsel you. John chapter 16 and verse 7. I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I go away. Unless I go, the, whole, the counsel will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. See, Jesus promised that he would send us the counselor, the Holy Spirit. Number four. Jesus taught us that the Holy Spirit would guide you and lead you into all truth. This is John chapter 16, verses 13 to 15. Jesus speaking. But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. These are beautiful promises. Number five. He, the Holy Spirit, will direct your life. This is a promise from the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk in it. Beautiful promise. Holy Spirit is going to direct you and guide you. And I'll comment a little bit more about it just now. Number six. The Holy Spirit will encourage you into the truth and the fact that you have become one of God's children. He will confirm your salvation and your adoption into God's family. Romans chapter 8 verses 14 to 16. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you have not received a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Okay. But you have received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry to Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is just beautiful. The Holy Spirit confirms that you're a child of God. Number seven. He, the Holy Spirit, will help you to live with him and he will help you to live out this Christian life. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Now, for a bit of homework, go and read the rest of Galatians chapter 5. And in Galatians chapter 5, it speaks about how we, how we, our choices in life have got two influences. There's the Holy Spirit that can influence our, our life choices and there is the that our flesh, our sinful nature, that can influence our choices. Okay? And um, God has given us the Holy Spirit to, to empower us to make choices that are going to please God and that are going to help us with our sanctification. Um, but it also recognizes that the enemy is going to be right there to try and tempt us with our fleshes, with our sinful natures, to, to go his way, to follow his guiding and leading on our lives. Now, as I've been talking, you might have been thinking, uh, now what are you talking about being led by the Spirit and being guided by the Spirit? And how, how will this happen? And the, the easiest way for me to explain it to you is, is like this. Have you ever been tempted to do something that you know is wrong? Now, when so that that's being led by an unclean spirit or by an evil spirit or by your sinful nature. And, and I'm sure we've all experienced that from time to time. And when, so yeah, you are, you're, you're a child of God and you're born again. And now the Bible teaches that, look, you've got two choices. You can be led by your flesh. You can be led by other spirits. And they're going to come and they're going to tempt you, just like they did Adam in the Garden of Eden. And they're going to, if you choose to give in to them and go the wrong way, then the sanctifying work of God's spirit in your life, your soul is, 
it's going to regress your mind, your will and your emotions. They're going to be pulled away from God and they're going to be taken down a path you don't want to go. But if you submit to the Holy Spirit and you allow Him to pour the Word of God and the Spirit of God and the truth of God into your life, and just ran out of some water there, but we've got this gloss here. If you allow God through the Spirit and the Church and, and the Word to renew you, you, your mind, your will and emotions can be sanctified. That process of sanctification can happen in your life. And so you've got a choice. You can be led by Satan, the flesh, the world and your sinful nature. Or you can be led by God, by the Holy Spirit, through His Word and through the Church of God, discipling you, guiding you and leading you. But you've got to make a choice in that matter. And the Holy Spirit is given by God to help you to choose the right thing over the wrong thing. Lastly, uh, I said nine, but there's actually eight. He, the Holy Spirit, will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. And he will counsel you and he will watch over you. Such a beautiful promise. Psalm chapter 32 and verse 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will counsel you and I will watch over you. And some translations, I think it's the New Living says, with my loving eye upon you. You see, my friends, this is the, just a wonderful teaching and truth of the, of, the, of, the, of the Bible and of the New Testament. That the Holy Spirit has been given to you by God to sanctify you and to guide you and to lead you in your Christian walk. And how do you receive him? You, you just simply ask God the Father. You speak to Jesus, the rock, and you say, Lord Jesus, please won't you come and fill me? Won't you come and baptize me? Father, I'm asking you to give me your gift that you promised, which is the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. And I'd like to take this opportunity now. I know that I, I, I gave you an opportunity to be, be born again last week. And this week I want to give you an opportunity not to be born again, but to be filled with God's Holy Spirit and to be to ask Jesus to baptize you and to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So if you can to do that, why don't you pray with me, sir? Say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm born again and I know that you are God's son and that you died on the cross to forgive, this all my, to forgive me of my sins and I've already been born again and I've received your salvation. But now this week, Bruce is teaching us that there's a second infilling of your spirit. There's a baptism of your Holy Spirit, where Holy Spirit, you come and fill my life. And so, Jesus, I'm asking you now, please baptize me with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I invite you to my life. Father God, I ask you to give me your gift and your promise, which is the person of the Holy Spirit living on the inside of me right now. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, my friend. I want you to keep on asking, keep on trusting God. And ask God to, to confirm this. Now, sometimes in the Bible that uh, the Holy Spirit was really received through the laying on of hands. And um, if, you have, if you haven't been touched by the Lord, then I encourage you to get a hold of one of your life group leaders or one of the community elders or get a hold of myself. And I would love to come and pray for you, lay my hands on you and trust God for an impartation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in your life. I trust that this teaching has helped you and that you've enjoyed it. Next week, I'm going, to, I'm going to end off this particular series on Christ our Rock. And I'm just going to summarize what we've learned. Look forward to seeing you there. God bless you. Have a great evening.